So good morning again. Um, did everybody get a handout? If you didn't get a handout, raise, raise your hand up in the air and wave around like you just don't care. Um, you know, really high so you can get one. It's really important. Your life depends on it. Okay. Fill in the blank. There's going to be a test and you know, not just kidding, but we are, it, you'll see. I think this will be extremely important to you later on. Just want to make sure everybody has one. I'm so glad you guys are here. Thanks, Jim, for passing those around. And um, I'm not going to make you draw anything. So even though some of you are like, that's really disappointing. But no, I'm not. So as we're kind of, as he's making sure everybody's got one of those, I want to ask you guys a question. If you were to go see the doctor tomorrow and the doctor were to give you some sort of diagnosis that says you have a choice, you're either going to die or you can change your lifestyle. Think about that for a minute. You go and see the doctor. He's like, you know what? You're going to die or you can change your lifestyle. How many of you would be like, I think I'll sign up for changing my lifestyle. I think I'll do that. Anybody? Okay, no, no. no yeah. Actually, I want to do a little survey here, okay? A little active survey. If you think you'd be like, you know what? I want to change because I don't want to die. Stand up. If you, if you think I, I don't want to die, I'm going to change my life. Stand up. Okay, look around. Some of you are just being rebellious, okay? Interestingly, interestingly y'all can sit down now. They actually did a study about this a few years ago up at John Hopkins University with heart patients. And doctors told the heart patients, listen, you have a choice. You're either going to change your lifestyle or because of your heart disease, you're going to die. And all of them are like, oh, I'm going to change my lifestyle. I'm going to change my lifestyle. In fact, 90% of them would not change their lifestyle. Only 10% of people usually if they're presented with the choice to change or die, don't change. It's kind of depressing, isn't it? So all of you guys are failures. You think highly, more highly of yourself than you really are. Um, but, but, it, it's just, it, but that whole idea has led people to this conclusion. And that study has actually been confirmed over and over again through different trials and different studies um, all over our country. But it's led people to, to believe that we cannot change. That change really is possible. That I am who I am. I mean, some of you have said that. When you said something stupid, you're like, well, that's just who I am. You know, this is just how God made me or whatever. We have this idea that we cannot change. And the reason why, it, it, or what I think, it's not that we can't change. It's that we all know that change is hard, right? I mean, it's so much easier just to stay the same. Change is difficult. But here's what I want you to know. For those of us who are followers of Jesus, this is so important. Change is at the core of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. That is, being a follower of Jesus requires that we are changed by Jesus. You can't follow Jesus and stay the same. Jesus says, I will make you into, follow me and I will make you into fishers of men. That I will make you is all about change. I want to take you from who you are right now and change you into who I want you to be. Well, Interestingly, some other researchers, also out of John Hopkins University, discovered that if you take those same people who normally would say, oh yeah, I'm going to change, but they don't change. If you take those same people and you do three things with those people, you can actually get 90, you can flip the numbers, you can get 90% of them to actually change their lifestyle. Look at these three things here. Um, one is relationships, the other one's habits, and the other one's a new way of thinking. If you take those same people and you put them in relationships with people that want to help them change, you help them develop some new habits. Let's say if it's a heart disease, like some new eating habits, some new exercise habits, maybe stopping some things that you need to stop doing, all that kind of stuff. And you can change how they think about themselves. Like if they can start thinking, you know what, I can change. I can do this. I can live a different way. If you do all those things, you can help people to change. Well, I just want you to look at these for just a minute because these three things that are required to help all of us change are actually embedded in the church. You think about that? The church is a community of relationships where we develop habits, spiritual disciplines, reading your Bible, praying, attending church, going to um, a small group, different, different you know, habits. And over time, we, we change how we think. We, we renew our mind, Scripture says. We, we let Scripture shape how I think. We do these things. Those are really the key to change. All, like relationships, habits, and new ways of thinking, they're all found in the church. Well, this series that we're in right now is all about change. 
It's all about us developing some habits in the context of our church relationship in changing how we think about some things in order for us to grow in spiritual maturity. And, and that the more we grow in spiritual maturity, the more we become the people that God has created us to be, the more we can reflect his glory in the world in which he's placed us. Well, there's a big churchy word that describes spiritual maturity. Maybe you've heard this before. It's the word sanctification. Maybe you've heard that. It means to be set apart. But really, it, it's, the word sanctification describes this process of moving towards spiritual maturity. Where God changes us over and over and over again from who we are right now into who he wants us to be. But what we discovered last week is that when it comes to sanctification, when it comes to spiritual maturity, something's missing. Like there's a secret out there that nobody told us about, or maybe we just kind of ignored for a lot of time. And that secret is what we're calling emotional health. And there's a direct link between being emotionally healthy and being spiritually mature. In fact, Pete Scazzaro says it this way. Look at this. It is not possible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. And so our goal throughout this series is to figure out this whole emotional maturity, emotional health thing... And develop that so that we can grow into spiritually mature followers of Jesus. Now, I just need to tell you, today might be a little depressing. Because today, we're going to do a little self-assessment to see how we would rate ourselves. Now, this is, this is not a morning for you to rate your spouse. <laughs> this is not a morning for you to rate the person that's sitting next to you or the person that you work with. This is a time for you to do some self-assessment and to rate Yourself to see where you are on that how emotionally healthy spectrum. Um, because the truth is, we can't figure out where we need to go until we figure out where we are. Like somebody said to me one time, the gospel the, uh, is bad news before it's good news. It's bad news that we're sinners in need of a savior. But the good news is that Jesus came to save us. Whenever you get diagnosed with something at the doctor, it's always bad news before they can give you the cure or the the, the prescription or whatever it is that you need to do, right? Well, we're going to talk about some bad news, hopefully, so that we can then get to some good news. And that's where this comes into play. I've given you a fill in the blank because we're going to talk about the top 10 signs of emotional unhealth. And as we talk through these, here's what I want you to do. I want you to just ask, how true is this statement of me? How true is this statement of me? So let's dive in. First one. First sign of emotional health is this. Using God to run from God. Now let me just, I forgot to tell you this. I didn't come up with these on my own. I, came, um, I got these from a guy by Pete Scazzaro who wrote a book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. It's a great book. that would be a great sub, um, supplement to this series. But first sign of emotional unhealth is using God to run from God. Let me explain this one. This is when... We get really, really, this is especially true for those of us who've been in church for a long, long time. When we're really busy doing things for God, but we ignore those areas in our life where we know that God wants to change us. Like we substitute spiritual activity for the work that God needs to do in us. For instance, I run from God when I do God's work to satisfy me, or I run, um, in, in, instead of using God to, uh, or I, I just totally lost my place. I use God to run from God when I do God's work to satisfy me. Or I use God to run from God when I do things that he's never asked me to do in order to please other people or to look really spiritual. Or I use God to run from God when um, my prayers are more about God doing my will than me surrendering to his will. See, one of the signs of emotional unhealth is where we use God to run from God. God's just an excuse for our agenda. God's just an excuse for our comfort. God's just an excuse for ourselves to look good. We use God to run from God. Second thing, sign of emotional unhealth, is ignoring the emotions of anger, sadness, and fear. Ignoring the emotions of anger and sadness and fear. I don't know why this is, but a lot of us who've been in church for a while, we believe that anger and sadness and fear are sins that need to be avoided Instead of emotions that need to, we need to be aware of and that we need to learn to express in a healthy way. Right? That, that, that these things are, are sins that we need to avoid instead of things that we need to learn how to I express. But did you know that your emotions are really... Bye. 
Um, <laughs> that way. See you later. Run faster. Um, that your emotions are in and of themselves, they're not sinful. In fact, to feel is to be human. And when we minimize or when we deny what it is that we're feeling, when we, when we ignore our emotions or when we sweep them under the rug, we're actually distorting and damaging what it means to be made in the image of God. You and I, we were, we were made in the image of God, and part of that involves our emotions. God gave us our emotions. And if we can't figure out how to healthily express our emotions and be aware of our emotions, then we're going to handicap ourselves and how we love God and our ability to love others and even our ability to love ourselves. Some of you, you're, you've been ignoring these emotions. That's a sign of emotional unhealth. Third sign, dying or dying to the wrong things. Let me kind of explain this to you by reading something that Jesus said in Luke chapter 9. Um, this is a great verse. I love this verse. I think we have it. There we go. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Great verse from Jesus. But there are some people out there, maybe it's even some of you, that take this to mean that the more miserable I am, the more I suffer, the more horrible my life is, then the more God loves me. The more I suffer, the more pleasing I am to God. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. Jesus is talking about dying to those selfish and sinful parts of ourselves. But never anywhere in Scripture are we called to die to the good parts of who we are. Nowhere are we called to die to those healthy desires, those healthy pleasures. See, I think those things are gifts from God. Just read the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes and over and over again Solomon tells us that the good things that we have in life are gifts from God to be enjoyed and not only that all of us have unique gifts and talents about how God has created us that we need to learn how to develop for his glory and we need to make sure we're not dying to the wrong things and some of us I think try and look super spiritual by denying ourselves so many things that Jesus said we never ever needed to deny ourselves so are you deny, dying to the wrong things? Next one. Denying the past's impact on the present. Denying the past's impact on the present. The good news in the scripture is that we who are followers of Jesus are described as people who are born again. People who are a new creation or new creatures. In fact, Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians. You probably have heard this before. The old has gone and the new has come. The old has gone. And the new has come. That's a great verse. And it means that our, our sins have been wiped away. We're no longer looked at on the basis of our sins. We have a new identity in Jesus. We have a new future. We have a new life. We have a new family. But it does not mean that our past won't continue to influence our presence and our future. Let me say that again. What this verse does not mean is that our past, and all of us have a past, and some of them are more messy than others, but all of us got suitcases, you know, some of you have trunks, but you know, we, we've all got a past. This does not mean that our past won't continue to influence our present and our future. And the work of sanctification, the work of growing in spiritual maturity, demands that we evaluate our past for unhealthy and destructive patterns in order to move forward. Some of us are stuck in the past somewhere. Some of us are stuck in something that happened to us in elementary school or middle school or in our first marriage or wherever. We're stuck back there and we've never dealt with that in order to move forward. But if you're going to work on that, you've got to stop denying the past's impact on the presence. Number five, dividing our lives into sacred or secular and sacred compartments. I found that, especially in Southern church world, which is what we live in, right? I mean, we're in South Carolina. I don't know if we're the buckle of the Bible belt, but we're like the first notch, you know what I mean? So um, we have a tendency for some reason to divide life into secular and sacred categories. And that is that we'll say, you know what, God, you can have my church life and you can have my Christian activities, but... Um, we leave God out of our marriages, and we leave God out of our work, and we leave God out of our hobbies, and we leave God out of our friends, or we leave God out of our online habits. But Jesus has a special word for those kind of people. He calls them hypocrites, right? 
People who say one thing don't do another or ask, you know, that, that God has not influenced every part of our life. But it, emotional, healthy people don't compartmentalize their lives into sacred and secular. It's all one. All of life is sacred. There is no secular part of our lives because God wants to be involved in all of our lives. Next one. Number six. This is great. Doing for God instead of being with God. Doing for God instead of being with God. Now, I know that in America especially, we live in a culture that values doing. You know how I know that? What's the first thing someone asks you when they meet you for the most part? What do you do? What do you do? So what do you do, Jonathan? I don't want to tell you. Uh, <laughs> as soon as I tell them I'm a pastor, it's all over, you know. Uh, I just work with messy people, you know, that's what I do. But, you know. But we, we just, we, we're defined by what it is that we do. Well, did you know that that bleeds into our spiritual lives all the time? Where we can substitute doing for God over being with God. Um, but think about it. We are human beings, not human doings. We're not defined by what it is that we do, especially in our spiritual lives. In our activity for God if we're going to do things for God, can only flow out of a life with God. And we're going to dive deep into this next week. This is really at the core of what it means to be emotionally healthy. But some of us struggle with doing for God instead of being with God. We'll talk more about that, like I said, next week. Um, the next symptom or sign of emotional unhealth is that we spiritualize, spiritualizing away conflict. Spiritualizing away conflict. Conflict. Um, we all, conflict is everywhere, right? I mean, some of you experienced on the way to church this morning. I mean, it, it, and some of you, actually, I think most of you in the room are probably like me. I mean, I mean, some of you are sociopaths and you like conflict, but that's a whole other category. But most of you like to avoid conflict, right? Or we make excuses or we pretend it didn't happen or we ignore it or we sweep it under the rug. And the reason we do that, especially if we're Christians, is because Jesus, look at what he calls us to be. He calls us to be peacemakers, he says this, he said, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. And we're like, well, we just kind of ignore, need to ignore our, 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 our conflict or sweep it under the rug or pretend like things didn't happen so we can be peacemakers. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus isn't talking about rolling over and playing dead. What he actually means is that we need to do the hard work of making peace. And to make peace is difficult. It's hard. It, it's challenging. And, and the good news is, though, that Jesus modeled this for us. Think about him for a minute. He was in constant conflict with people, religious leaders, the disciples. I mean, his closest one, he told him to get behind me, Satan, you know, to, to Peter one time. I mean, he was in conflict with his own family. He was in conflict with crowds. But Jesus never spiritualized away conflict. And instead, he did the opposite. He modeled for us what it means to address conflict in a healthy manner. Read John chapter 8 when he, the, the, the interaction he has with the religious leaders over the woman caught in adultery. Lead, uh, read just all kind of instances where he calls out the religious leaders for their hypocrisy and stuff. Jesus just models for us what it means to address conflict in a healthy manner. But if, some, if you have the sign of spiritualizing away conflict, then maybe you have some emotional unhealth. The next one. Number eight, covering our brokenness, weakness, and failure. Covering our brokenness, brokenness, weakness, and failure. I, um, I don't know what it is, but especially the longer we're Christians, the more pressure we feel to act like we have it all together. Right? I mean, we, th there's this pressure that we all feel to present an image of ourselves where, like, you know what, I I'm good. I have it all together spiritually. And then secretly we feel guilty when we fall short. And we, I don't know what it is, but we forget. Or we ignore or we just pretend like it's not real. But we, we, we forget that we're not perfect, right? That we're actually all sinful people. Um, but I want you to remember David. We talked about David last week. Remember David, the, the second king in Israel's history, the guy who wrote most of the Psalms he's the perfect picture of someone who's both emotionally healthy and spiritually mature. But at the same time, 
I mean, you know David's story, right? I mean, he committed adultery, and then he committed murder to cover up the adultery. Now, I'm I'm not suggesting that you follow his example there, but what I am suggesting is that he's a great example of someone who was honest about his failures. He was honest about his weaknesses. He was honest about where he fell short. He even wrote this in Psalm 51. I love this right here. He says, my sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, O God, will not despise. The reason why I love this is because David could have sacrificed all kinds of stuff to God. Money, animals, whatever. But a sacri- he decided to sacrifice his broken spirit, his contrite heart, and he says that God honors that. Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, he was also one to not shy away from his weaknesses. Look at what God said to Paul. He says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I love that because God didn't even want to negate Paul's weaknesses. He wanted to glorify himself through Paul's weaknesses. And one of the things that I find amazing about the Bible as, a, as an entire piece of literature, and one of the things that I think shows that it can be trusted and that it's true, is that it never covers up the flaws and the weaknesses of its heroes. Think about that. It never does. Abraham, the father of the Israelites, was, a, was deceitful. He was a liar. He had really weak faith at times. He took things into his own hand. You had David who committed murder and, and adultery. You've got Peter who's always putting his foot in his mouth and saying things he shouldn't say. The Bible is filled with people who are deeply flawed and weak. And I think that should be encouraging to us because we're the same way, right? We're more like them than we want to admit. We don't have to pretend that we have it all together. Um, The number nine sign of emotional unhealth is living without limits. Living without limits. Anybody know somebody that has trouble saying no? Maybe that's you, you know? That, That you just have trouble saying no. I think that describes a lot of us. And we tend to do too much or we tend to do things that we're not created to do. Or things that we're not good at. And we don't know what our limits are. And I think this bleeds into our spiritual lives. And a lot of times we can feel guilty that we're not doing more or we're not meeting other people's needs. But I've got good news for all of us. And I hope you know this. You're not God. I'm not God. We can't meet everybody's needs. And you know what I find amazing? Jesus modeled this for us perfectly. Think about it. He's the son of God, which means he's both fully human and fully God. Yet at the same time, Jesus needed to take naps because he got tired. Jesus did not heal every sick person in Palestine. Jesus did not raise every person from the dead. Jesus did not feed everybody who was hungry. Why? Because he knew his limits and he lived within his limits. And if Jesus did that, maybe we should too. I think we need to be honest about our limits. And for some of you, this series, you're going to be made aware of some of your limits. And you're going to be able to live more the life that God has called you to live because you are aware of your limits. And you're not trying to be somebody that God did not create you to be. And the last sign of emotional unhealth is this. Judging the spiritual journey of others. Now, none of of you guys do this. I mean, but um, you know people that do this, right? You, you know people who think that it is their divine responsibility to correct people who are wrong. That it's their divine responsibility to point out in other people everything that they're doing wrong. The problem with that, as we all know, is that just leads to a spiritual pride. We spend so much time pointing out what's wrong in other people that we never look in the mirror to see what's really going on with us. But remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7? Let's let this sink in. He says, do not judge or you too will be judged, which sounds a little intimidating. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. This is one of those things we wish Jesus didn't say. He goes on and says this though. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. There's that word. First take the plank out of your own eye. And then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. The truth is, we don't have enough time 
to point out the specks in other people's eyes. Because we all have some planks in our own that we need to take care of. We all have some mess in our own lives that we need to work on. So if you find yourself judging the spiritual journey of others, it might be a sign of emotional unhealth. So take a look at this list that I've given you. These are the top ten signs of emotional health. Here's what I want you to do with this. I want you to go back over this list. You can do it right now, but um, I encourage you to actually to take some time this afternoon or maybe um, this week uh, a couple times to look back over this. And I, I want you to rate yourself with each of these statements on a scale of one to five. What I want you to do is I want you to, one being that you don't struggle with this at all, this is not a problem for you, five being, man, this hit the nail on the head. I want you to rate yourself. And I want you to be honest with yourself. You're not trying to impress anybody because the only person that's going to watch you doing this, unless you have a sneaky spouse or sneaky child, um, is God. And why would you be dishonest with yourself when God already knows what's really going on inside of you, right? So I want you to take some time and I want you to evaluate yourself and to see where you are because it's only when we figure out what it is that we need to work on that we can actually start to work on those things so that we can be sanctified, so that we can grow in spiritual maturity, so that we can develop some emotional health. I think that as you do that, that's going to prepare you for what we're going to talk about over the next few weeks. But as we kind of wrap up, I want to leave you with this as a reminder. Something that Paul wrote. If you're in a hub group, this meeting, you talked about that this, this past week. It says, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence. And this is the part that I want to stand out to you. Continue to work out your salvation. That's sanctification. That's growing in spiritual maturity. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, take it seriously. That's what he means when he says to work it out with fear and trembling. This isn't something that you should be flippant about. This is something that's serious. Like if the doctor were to say, look... You either change your lifestyle or you're going to be dead in three months. That's kind of what he's getting at here when he says work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Do your part. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. See, what that means is that when we do our part to work out our salvation, then God does his part to work in us, to will and to, and to act in order to fill his good purpose. And his good purpose... As you growing in spiritual maturity, you growing into the person that looks more like Jesus every day, that every day you look more and more like Jesus. So, your homework, evaluate yourself. And I know some of you are going to be tempted to just forget about this when you leave today, and that's cool. I hope you feel guilty. Um, but, because the, I, want us to, I want you to figure out where you are so you can figure out where it is that you need to go. Let's pray. God, Thanks for the opportunity to talk about um, these signs of emotional unhealth. And I think that when, you know, when I look at my life and when I look at the people who are in the room, um, we all have some areas in our lives where we show some of these signs of emotional unhealth. And I ask that you would give us the courage to be honest with ourselves and honest with you about where it is that we need some work. Um, and then, God, would you bring us back next week so that we can start that work of moving towards emotional health so that we can grow in spiritual maturity, so that we can be the people that you've called us to be. God, I think that there's potential for some incredible life change to happen over the next few weeks. And that requires two things. That requires us doing our part, so give us the courage and the discipline to do our part. But that also requires you doing your part. And so I, I beg you to do what it is that only you can do in each of our lives so that we can be sanctified, so that we can grow in spiritual maturity, so that we can be set apart to be salt and light in the representatives that you've called and created us to be where we are. We love you. Thank you for this time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to give you an opportunity to respond like we respond every week by sharing communion. And we share communion because it reminds us of the good news. And the good news is 
first bad news, right? That we're sinners and that we deserve God's wrath. But the good news is that Jesus came to satisfy God's wrath. He died on the cross for us. And we remember that um, with communion. We remember it by the bread, which reminds us that Jesus' body hung on a cross for us. Let's remember that his body was broken for us. And then with the juice, we remember that on the cross, Jesus' blood was shed so that our sins could be forgiven. Let's remember. Why don't you just close your eyes and tell God thank you for the sacrifice that he made on your behalf. Jesus, thank you for taking care of our sin problem. Thank you for making a way for us to have a relationship with you that's not hindered by sin anymore. We remember your sacrifice. And with this taking of communion, we proclaim what you have done for us to one another and to the world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.